more than likely it's going to be in this form. Why? Because it's discrete. Why? Because you can vaporize it in your jewel, in your e-cig, mixed with nicotine, and you can't even smell it. And you can just <laughs> micro hit it and boom. And if you get pulled over by law enforcement or you get questioned by security, all you have is a jewel. You don't have any bud that can be smelt. You don't have a bag. You don't have paraphernalia. All you've got is your jewel. Oh, that's just my jewel, man. That's nothing. So chances of actually getting caught with it are reduced. Perceived level of harm is low. And the problem with these ash oils is it's 75% THC. Remember the three and a half from the 80s? Five people sharing one joint. This is a young person smoking 75%. I mean, what is, what is the times of that? That's like 15, 20 times the, the amount of THC delivered. There's no titration in this. One puff, and you are blasted. You are ripped. You are very, very impaired. Cannabis, particularly bad idea for kids. Yes. Um, lays down that no skill, no effort, high reward circuitry in the brain. Once that brain learns, do I engage in things that require skill and effort and only give me a little itty bitty return? That sounds like a lot of work. I gotta get on my bike, I gotta ride at school, I gotta go to practice, I gotta practice for three days, and then come game time, if I'm lucky, I get a play, and then I get my dopamine. Or do I just hit this big pen with some hash oil in it and feel better than I would? If I made that touchdown. And I hate to say that, but that's how drugs work. It's an unnatural level of euphoria that the human brain was never supposed to experience. It malforms who we are, what we hold valuable, our passions. It interferes with positive pro-social experimentation with healthy things. It can rob you. It impairs judgment. Psychotic breaks with this high level THC is happening more and more. So, you know, that's just a little bit. Is it a gateway drug? I'm not a big fan of gateway drugs, uh, the term gateway drug. I don't like a fan of gateway drugs either, but I'm not a fan of the term. I like to call it a drug of association because how it starts is think about it. Think about when we were all junior high, high school, why did we do things? Because we experienced social anxiety, because we were insecure, low self-esteem, low self-image. When we walked into a room, we felt like everybody was looking at us, and we wanted to fit in. So if you're hanging out with a group of 20 people, and something is introduced to that group of 20 people, chances are you're gonna engage in it. What depends is your parental perceived level of harm or acceptance. For kids who graduate high school, who have never used a substance, or alcohol or drug-free, they graduate, 75% of them report their parents' perceived level of harm was the reason why they didn't use drugs. So if you think how you view these things don't affect your children, all the research shows it does. But when those kids are in those group of 20, that parental approval is the thing that will make that child break away from that. Is one of the things. So if somebody introduces cigarettes to a group of 20, there's probably going to be five or more kids who are going to be like, yeah, no, I'm good. Catch you guys later. Walk away. They may or may not reassociate with that group. That's cool, because they're going to find people who share the same interests and same activities. 15 kids were left. Later down the road, somebody comes in with cannabis, marijuana. Maybe five more kids were like, uh, yes, you know, I'm okay with nicotine, but, uh, uh, man, my mom or dad would kill me. And, you know, I hear that interferes with things like my sports and stuff. I'm good. Catch you later. And that group is now left with 10. And then if maybe down the road a little later, somebody enters a group with cocaine or perks or benzos. And there's 10 in there. 
Maybe five of them would be like, oh, dude, yo, those are hard drugs. That's where I draw a line, man. We is all I'll do. Walk away. Now you're left with a group of five. And that's really how gateway drugs work. It's more of an association. But what can stop that is clear expectations from parental units, boundaries, guidelines, consequences, clear expectations. But of all the opiate use disorder individuals who were interviewed, their drugs of first use were all alcohol and marijuana. And that's how it started. They were the unlucky souls who didn't walk away from that social group. So cannabis soil, high, very high in THC. Here in Pennsylvania, we have medicinal marijuana. Two treats over 23 um, diagnoses. Um, you know, you can go to the Department of Health website and read more about it. Um, really don't have, I think that if it treats a, a, a disorder, cool. There's scientific data that shows it's effective for things like seizure disorders and Crohn's disease. And, you know, helps with cancer, um, chronic pain. It's what's called an entourage effect. So you have these things called terpenes, CBD, CBNs, THCs. They all work together. And it's very important to have all of these things together in medicine and when you're talking about marijuana because they all solicit different um, effects. Except when you combust cannabis, particularly in flowering form, you lose the majority of the terpenes. There's over a hundred terpenes in marijuana which give it the aroma. Um, so if you remove the terpenes through combustion or carbonization, you lose some of the medicinal qualities of that. When you vaporize it, you lose some of the CBNs, the terpenes, as well as reduce the CBD. So again, you're losing the medicinal factor of that drug. Really, the, the most effective way to manufacture and to deliver this is through tincture, sublingual uh, administration under the tongue or ingestion. Because that way you get all the terpenes, the CBNs, the CBDs, and even THCs. THCs are the one that make us euphoric. However, when you are talking about hash oils, particularly butane hash oils, First of all, the method of which it's manufactured, you actually manufacture it by using butane. You take the firing material, you stuff it, I won't tell, this is going to be YouTube, I won't go into detail of how it's manufactured. Essentially, you strip the THC off of the marijuana plant material by using five or six big bottles of butane lighter fluid. That lighter fluid then lands in a cookie sheet, it slowly boils off at room temperature and evaporates, and what you're left with is either a wax, a shatter, um, oh, I thought I had a picture in here. Oh, here we go. Wax, shatter, or crumble. The only problem with that are those products contain the residual butane byproducts, which are heavy metals and neurotoxins. Colorado and many other states have banned butane hash oil products from being sold in the dispensary because it poses a significant health risk. You'll talk to some individuals and they'll be like, well, they purge it. You cannot purge completely a butane. And you'll never get the heavy metals or the neurotoxins out of there. Um, in PA, you can go to any website um, and you can check out some of the dispensaries in the local area. Go to their website, go to the menu, and what you'll see are products. The majority of their products are BHO. And the majority of their products don't contain CBDs or CBNs. The majority of their products contain THC and THC only. That's not necessarily utilizing medicine in the best form. I'm never going to question somebody who's experiencing cancer and they go there and they find that it works. Great. But my problem with it is the misinformation that's being given to young people that this is medicine. And it shouldn't be feared. All medicine comes with a risk. No medicine is given by a medical doctor and say, here, go there and pick out what you want and take as much as you want because there is no limit in medicinal marijuana in Pennsylvania. You can go in and purchase as much as you want. Some places impose an eight 
for a seven gram limit on firing material, but that's only because they would sell out. So, when we're looking at medicinal marijuana, I'm all for it. Great, good, it helps people. Let's look at how it's regulated and how it's dispensed. Because right now, unfortunately, it's being diverted into the hands of developing brains. And if you don't think it is, that's a whole other conversation. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about some of the young people who present in my office and report where they get their marijuana from. So, this is not healthy, this is not safe. DHOs should be significantly concerning to anybody who wants to avoid neurotoxins. Um, you can go to Jewel and you can watch a video of a 30-some-year-old uh, man with a beard showing kids how to hack their Jewel and put hash oil into their Jewel. Um, and so that's really kind of you know, my, my, my piece here. It starts with experimentation. It's natural. But right now we live in an environment that has very ease of access to lots of different unhealthy things. We have very pure items that are easily accessible and there's a low perceived level of harm about all of them. What we should be exposing our youth to are healthy, positive, pro-social things. Because if you don't give them something healthy to experiment, they're going to experiment with something unhealthy. That unhealthy, unfortunately, is alcohol and tobacco nicotine products. And then that nicotine product, through that association model, can lead to cannabis and other things. And when we have a very low perceived level of harm about cannabis, you know, it's, that's a problem. Um, you know, um, so anyway, I don't want to come off as like too anti-pot. Right? It's a medicine, absolutely. It can help people. If my child was experiencing some sort of seizure disorder, I would absolutely converse with a medical team and see if that's appropriate. It's just, you know, the abuse potential is there. All right, I think we have some time for some questions, right? We were to 7.30, and I think I made that mark, 7.30, all right. Cool, so how do you want to do this? Do you just want to, want to arm the mic and Uh, you want me to keep it on? So questions. I know bad questions, only really bad answers. I'd like to think I don't get those. We'll see. No questions. No. I have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, you know how like uh, secondhand smoke, is there a second? Oh, let me give you a mic, so. No, I don't Well, they're recording it, so. Oh, okay. I just had a question, like the secondhand smoke issues, is the same with the so secondhand vape, yeah. yeah. Um, it would have to be in a very controlled environment, like say a car, you know, windows up when you're in the car. Yes, you're going to have some nicotine exposure secondhand. But the thing with the, the aerosol is that it disperses very rapidly into the environment. So you're not necessarily going to let it's not the same as, as smoke. Um, so secondhand vape is a thing, but only in closed space. If I'm Throwing down 120 for a meal at a restaurant and you get next to me, I'm not going to be disgruntled. Yes, because there's no aroma there. There's an odor to there. And there's just the idea of this toxic substance being blown into the area. It's not as severe as smoking. But, you know, we're looking at the point source user. That's, you know, I'm concerned with the young people's health, and I don't want them to experience any type of cardiovascular disease or cancer. Other questions? Should I make some up? <laughs> Just the one thing about vaping and the lungs, and what it does to the lungs. You know, you can hear the popcorn lung. Yeah, so I don't usually talk about popcorn lung, because um, it, it's more, you know, um, kind of like scared. Popcorn lung is caused by diacetyl. Diacetyl is FDA-approved food flavoring. And there was a case of some, uh, uh, popcorn industry workers working in a popcorn microwave pop popcorn plant. Their, uh, the air filtration system was not working effectively and they were exposed to high levels of diacetyl over a period of time. And they actually came down with scarred lung tissue and that's where we came up with popcorn lung. If you vape, you're going to end up with popcorn lung. We don't know that. We can't say that because we don't have the data. We know that diacetyl is in some of the flavorings, but we don't know where and when it's going to show. 
So it's kind of like, you know, rolling the dice. Am I going to get an ingredient that is going to scar my lung tissue? What we do know is that the majority of the flavors suspended in vegetable glycerin and you know, propylene glycol um, are irritants. And nicotine actually can burrow into your cardiovascular uh, system, your, your arterial walls can create holes, which take away the smoothness of the arteries. It's also leaving residual um, inflammation, which can create scar tissue on the small scale of your lung tissue. And so we're seeing, you know, lung scans of lungs which have black holes in them, and they've never used tobacco product. So yeah, the lung tissue damage is obvious. I mean, these lungs, this is raw flesh. This is unprotected flesh that you're exposing to something that was never designed to be exposed to. And this is the only thing it's supposed to be coming in contact with is oxygen rich air. That's it. Anytime you put anything else in it, you are doing damage. It's just to what level we don't have a cell. Yeah, Lee. I'm gonna try and get you this mic. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for coming up here at Penn Ridge. I think we're really lucky to have you here in Bucks County with such knowledge. Thank you so much. I guess my question tonight and a comment. Uh, we uh, have a youth coalition that's been around here for a long time. It goes up and down with funding and grants. A few years ago, we had some funds to try to help students who wanted to quit uh, go into a cessation program during the school day, since they were here during the day. And I don't know if you know the answer, maybe we should someone from Penn Ridge. Around, you know, once we, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Gallo said there were nine uh, students that were caught devices. You know, I don't know what the consequence for that is, but hopefully we can get them into a mandated class that'll teach them this information and learn skills to quit. And then I guess my other comment is, I don't know if folks from Penridge could share some data that we have here. It's, it's good to know national and county data, but we have Penridge data too. It might be helpful to share that with uh, the folks here so they know our issue. And then final one, third question for Mr. Warner. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the student assistance program. That's, there's so many trained professionals here to help students, you know, so they don't have to get caught trying to get it preventative way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, um, all really, really good, relevant points. The, the problem with youth cessation is we talked about pre-contemplation, contemplation, plan, and action. If somebody is in the pre-contemplation stage, which most youth who use nicotine products are, they have a perceived level of harm, they don't see a problem with it, it hasn't impacted their life in some shape or form other than policy violations at school, they're like, this ain't a problem, this is your problem. They're not going to engage in treatment effectively. And that's why we don't have any proven data on effective methods of nicotine or smoking cessation for youth, is their brains are just so sensitive to nicotine and they, all they focus on are the benefits from it. They don't see a problem. So nicotine replacement is usually not particularly effective unless that youth wants to quit. And what we're seeing now, uh, actually, are, are more and more youth identifying, well, wow, I, I do, I am addicted, and this has impacted my ability. Um, so, you know, again, you know, the FDA, 18 and older for nicotine patches, however, with parental consent and medical team, you know, we can, we can, you know, link them up with resources where they may be able to use a an NRT, nicotine replacement treatment. Um, you know, reducing the nicotine content in the vape device is, is not approved, and I would say that's not a, a, a beneficial form of cessation. Um, if you had a question for Joe, I would uncut to Joe. So, Lynn and I may jump in here uh, sporadically, but just to address uh, uh, Lee's uh, point on the uh, student assistance program. So that is a, a program here at the high, high school. Uh, we have a, a SAP team, um, and you know, if there is uh, a student concern, it can be you know, various issues, uh, drug and alcohol, and certainly now, um, you know, vaping, 
going in there. But what happens is that um, you know triggers collecting uh, information on the students so that we can see you know are there other patterns or other you know teachers, school staff seeing any concerning behavior uh, that we would want to address that we want to you know uh, bring the parents in and, and talk about other interventions uh, that could be done. Uh, could be school interventions. Could be community interventions. Um, other interventions directly related to vaping, um, still still kind of out there. We're trying to figure this out. Um, we have used uh, the Bucks County uh, Beat Chip um, Health Improvement uh, Program. They have a smoking cessation program over at Grandview Hospital. Um, so that, that is available. Uh, but again, this is kind of like a, you know, a little bit of a moving target. So uh, perfecting the, the interventions on how to deal with vaping um, is, is ongoing. Um, and, uh, and just one other thing that we're adding this year as well. Um, Joe had mentioned some, and they, they were really good questions. And unfortunately, Officer Alcott had a call and he had to leave. Um, and Joe Gallo, who is our security director, he also, but you can send questions in. Uh, he had said to email, you can even email for me, most of the staff that are here, and even parents, you can look up my email um, on the high school website, l at penridge.org. I will be happy to get those questions um, and get answers for you, and we'll get them back to you. On our website also, as I mentioned, we're gonna have this program on there, um, and as we're also gonna have um, some resources. We do have on the high school website, SAP, and SAP is for high school, middle, and elementary. <coughs> elementary, we have a program that, uh, new this year. Uh, very proactive, really trying to get with students that, that need help. Um, if they're vaping and if they're doing something, they definitely need help. And our goal this year, and we actually have started with the nine or so that we've confiscated, um, the assistant principal, and usually myself as nursing coordinator, we will get with that student and really try to do education, which I think is great because, as David mentioned, you know, you're taking, you're punishing them, taking away that, what are you replacing it with? So we, we've actually met, and I'm hoping that that is going to be a good thing. Since the start of the year, we've met with each of those students that have had a violation. I met with them for probably a good half hour. We try to talk about what their interests are, what things are they doing after school? Are they, we try to get them in clubs. Um, the assistant principal has connected with them after we've met, myself included, and try to say, like, what are you doing? Are you, you don't have to be in sports, you don't have to be doing music, whatever it is, but a club or just something to see what they're doing after school. Um, but as I said, the question, please give them to us. And as I said, unfortunately, um, I can't answer really for. Um, Officer Alcott, he did have some good information that he was doing for the community. So, um, I hope that um, Just also for, for staff, uh, Lindy's going to send uh, the PowerPoint. There will also be an evaluation that David always likes to get feedback from, so please take the time um, and look at that. Um, other questions as we're talking here, too? Yeah. How many incidents have you had in the past year? So when uh, Joe Gallo started, uh, he estimated uh, the devices that they took is about one a month. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, one a week. One a week. So that sounds like a systemic problem about school. What was that? That at least sounds like a systemic problem throughout school. So, the systemic problem. What is the temperature? I would say, what would they do to address that? And what I like, put it a different way, is there any way to detect like you would with, say, marijuana or any other? I keep on going to marijuana or any other. Okay, no, 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 no. right. yeah, um, so there's these uh, vape detectors that have been utilized in some school districts. They, uh, they detect aerosol in the air, not smoke, but aerosol moisture, um, and they send it live time to an administrator's or um, uh, the staff's phones um, or smart devices. Uh, 
It's a, it, it is a significant investment, and uh, I do know that some schools that have implemented these have run into some problems with them. Uh, you know, if you YouTube how to hijack these or sabotage them, you know, it's everything from you know, sticking wet toilet paper up in it, and then it basically disables that device for the day. Um, so there is a lot of cost, and they're not perfect. Um, I talked about, you know, the, uh, the micro-hitting, and where you don't even need to really, you know, exhale it, um, and, and swallowing it. Um, how do we catch that? You know, um, I, you know, we, I'm not employed by a school. Um, I have no association with the schools. We're a nonprofit, uh, you know, recovery support treatment provider uh, in Doylestown. But realistically, what it comes down to is social norms. We need to educate the kids and families on these farms, and we need to have very clear expectations with very clear consequences associated if you get caught with this, if I detect it, if I bring you in for, you know, uh, a oral swab for nicotine. Um, nicotine leaves the system within two hours, so it's very difficult to detect. Um, there are some uh, levels, there are some tests that can show nicotine use for up to 30 days previous, but those are very expensive. Those aren't your typical urine drug screens. Those are very scientific-based tests. So how, hey, how do you catch somebody who's currently using it? And realistically, the only way we could do that is searching, right? You know, searching an individual, looking for these devices, because the use of it is so discreet and so difficult to catch. And when you go that route, we're going down a slippery slope. Do we want to go there? And realistically, the schools are able to search a student. They actually have more power, and, I'm, and I hope I'm not overstepping my boundary, um, than law enforcement does. Law enforcement doesn't have that ability at that level to search the student as does the school. But the schools usually have that law enforcement officer in there in that situation if there is a search necessary as kind of, you know, you know a, a cooperative agreement. Um, so I don't know if there's a really good answer to your question, sir. Um, I would imagine you're a parent and you're concerned, and I am a parent and I am very concerned. And I like to think that, you know, all of our children are making the right decisions and they're not going to be the one. Um, but we really need to get the message out there that this is harmful, that this is not a healthy alternative to smoking. And access, perceived level of harm, and potency. So access is number one. You know, everybody's anti-ban, can't ban things. But when they're being predatorily marketed towards you know, our most vulnerable population, I do. Perhaps banning some of this stuff might be the start. I hate to talk like I'm, I'm a veteran, I believe in freedoms, and now it's, uh, but public health, you know, freedom ain't free. Sometimes we gotta make sacrifices. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. All right, thank you. He, he, he took me off the hot seat. procedures that are limited in scope and realistically around with being implemented because we don't want to become that invasive entity. So when they're caught, you know, but good question, but um, I'm going to, yeah, thank you. <laughs> good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Cash, I'm the principal of the high school. Um, I'm going to just take kind of a quick answer, and I don't have a, a simple black and white answer. Um, people have talked to me about vaping here at the high school before, and the reality of it is that I appreciate all the information we shared tonight. It's it's tough. It's you know I would love to say that we have a plan and it's all going to be gone by the end of next week, and that's really not the case. Um, so we do have policies regarding vaping, uh, both with nicotine as well as with THC. 
Um, one of the things that we really have taken a look at and part of tonight's presentation too was not necessarily just designed about why it was so bad because I think it was mentioned. We talk to students all the time about why something is bad and most of the students who do it know it's bad but they're still doing it anyway. So one of the things that we started really looking at when it came to the vaping was not just to say how to, how to um, prevent it, because we do have systems in place. Those of you who work here and many of the parents know, we have safe to say. The majority of our safe to say tips, which is anonymous tip line, really comes through with vaping, telling us what bathrooms to students are using them in, telling us who the students are, telling them where they're hiding it. Most of those vapes.